Oh God! Oh Jesus Christ! Belief can be a terrifying thing. When one guy goes off the rails because he says his neighbor's dog is telling him to kill people, we can easily dismiss that as a fluke of some kind, as some sort of societal aberration. But if 5, 10, 15 people all get together and then they start saying the same thing, then we might start to worry. Underneath whatever outside coercive forces there might be, be they the mandates of an emperor or the influence of social media, I think the ultimate deciding factor of whether a belief is truly embraced or not, or even simply tolerated for any extended period of time, lies in how useful it might be. Do your beliefs inspire great works of art? Do they build community? Do they maximize wealth, prosperity, and happiness for a majority of people? Are your beliefs easy to understand? I will never apologize for standing up for an LGDP, uh, LGT, LBG. Ideally, a change or evolution in belief is a voluntary process. Ideally, the new beliefs are a complement or a supplement to whatever prior, longer standing beliefs an individual or community might want to preserve. But what about when that's not the case? What about when beliefs collide or when one tries to impose their beliefs onto another? Well, then, then comes. The Wicker Man. The Wicker Man begins with Police Sergeant Neil Howie arriving by plane to the remote Scottish island of Summer Isle looking for a missing girl. The old men at the harbor, they try to turn him away until he impresses upon them his authority as a police officer. And here already we have our first salvo in the War of Beliefs. The mainland rule of law asserting itself over a people so isolated they might have assumed themselves exempt from it or else beholden to other greater forces. Already we're given a sense of Sergeant Howie's inflexibility, his deep sense of right and wrong. Edward Woodward uses his voice with precision and to great effect as he blusters about the island, his command and his confidence consistently undercut by the villagers' secrecy and reluctance to cooperate. Sergeant Howie shows the old men a picture of the missing girl, but they claim not to recognize her. From there it's on to the sweet shop, where the girl's mother claims not to know her either. At a glance, Summer Isle appears like any other small rural hamlet. There's a quaint pastoral quality to the island and its people. Oh my! Did you come over in that aeroplane that I saw flying round? The viewer's sympathies are challenged by just how appealing, how ordinary so much of Summer Isle seems to be. The viewer might sympathize with the idea of some external provocateur, however justified he might be in his motivations, arriving out of nowhere to disrupt such a seemingly idyllic way of life. At the tavern, we're introduced to Britt Eklund as Willow, the landlord's daughter, followed by our first spontaneous outburst of song from the villagers. The landlord's daughter. Music plays an important role in The Wicker Man. Here, music is an outpouring of spiritual reverie. Sergeant Howie, he only sings in church. But for the nature-worshipping pagans on Summer Isle, everywhere is their church. So that any moment is a perfect opportunity for song. If not strictly a musical, The Wicker Man seems to double as a kind of visual concept album, a dark side of the moon that really does sync up to The Wizard of Oz. One of the most memorable musical set pieces involves a nude Brit Eklund with some assistance from a body double, writhing and pounding on the walls of her bedroom, the very spirit of lust as she tries to coax Sergeant Howie next door into bed with her. Along with music, it's sex that comes up again and again throughout The Wicker Man. It's maybe their divergent attitudes towards sex by which we're able to draw any real material distinction between the societal organization of Summer Isle and the mainland. Sergeant Howie, with his rigorous Puritan forbearance, is at once mortified and perhaps a little jealous of the Summer Isles and their free love. Willow's sultry petitioning reduces him to a sweating, quivering mess, and yet even still he remains unbroken, waking up the next morning with his honor, his faith, and, as he soon reveals, his virginity all intact. Continuing his investigation, Sergeant Howie arrives at the school, where the phallic symbolism of the maypole is juxtaposed to a beetle winding itself up around a nail. <laughs> a little old beetle goes round and round, always the same way, you see, until it ends up right up tight to the nail. Thing. At the same time, we might also make a comparison between the Beetle and Sergeant Howie and the ultimate fruitlessness of his investigation. The Maypole, the Beetle, Sergeant Howie, 
the three elements all put together, does it mean to suggest that the sergeant's drive and his altruism are all but the manifestation of wayward sexual energies, frustrated expressions of a sexual repression imposed on him by his own beliefs? If so, it's not necessarily a bad thing. His call to heroism is admirable, if a puritanical self-denial is what compels a person towards meaningful good, then so be it. It's Sergeant Howie's heroism that endears us to him as a character. It's the ultimate fruitlessness, the naivete of the heroism, that by the end of the film makes us pity him. It makes the trick the villagers play on him all the more cruel and tragic. From the school, it's on to the ruins of a church where the missing girl supposedly lies dead and buried, and where Howie fashions a frustrated makeshift cross out of an apple crate. Then it's on to the manner of the Lord of Summer Isle, from whom the sergeant hopes to get permission to exhume the girl's body. Another thing that makes The Wicker Man so memorable is Christopher Lee as Lord Summer Isle, delivering one of the best, most eccentric performances of his career. After a long, successful run with Hammer Films, Lee had become mostly associated with dark, menacing characters like Dracula or Rasputin, or with the odd stentorian doctor or police detective playing opposite Peter Cushing. He was looking to branch out, was looking to do something a bit out of the ordinary. In The Wicker Man, Christopher Lee disarms his prey with a wide-eyed, childlike smile, with a tweed jacket, tennis shoes, and a wild quaff of hair. He's the self-styled New Age eccentric, a shade of Timothy Leary or Aleister Crowley, a premonition of Steve Jobs. The comparisons with some sort of Silicon Valley godhead don't stop with his appearance either, as Lord Summer Isle reveals to Sergeant Howie that everything the island holds dear, from its crops to its pagan belief system, were all the brainchild of his grandfather, a Victorian scientist of agriculture. In the last century, the islanders were starving. Like our neighbors today, they were scratching a bare subsistence from sheep and sea. Then in 1868, my grandfather bought this barren island and began to change things. You see, his experiments had led him to believe that it was possible to induce here the successful growth of certain new strains of fruit that he had developed. So, with typical mid-Victorian zeal, he set to work. The best way of accomplishing this, so it seemed to him, was to rouse the people from their apathy by giving them back their joyous old gods. And that as a result of this worship, Barren Island would burgeon and bring forth fruit in great abundance. What does it mean, then, that at the root of all the villagers' primitive ceremony and appeals to nature is a methodical social engineering? What does it mean when they commit sacrifice and petition the earth to bless them with crops that were never meant to grow there in the first place? Does Christopher Lee really believe the same way the villagers do, or has he simply inherited a convenient mechanism for control? Whether intended or not, maybe we can infer this particular plot point as a sort of allusion to the way hedonism and technology seem to increasingly go hand in hand. The pagans, the hedonists of today, seem to take a majority of their pleasure and do most of their outreach over the internet, over cell phones and computers, all the fruits of the very civilization they would claim to rebel against. It's this lingering capitalist underpinning, the normalcy of it, that I think is part of what makes life on Summer Isle in some ways so appealing. It's the kind of paganism where you can sing songs, have casual sex, and jump naked over bonfires, but still go home to your warm bed at night. You can stop for a drink at the pub, you can buy a nice cake at the sweet shop. Summer Isle doesn't seem to be without at least some sort of economy, in that it's implied they export some of their crops, when their crops do grow, to the mainland or elsewhere. It's no coincidence, I don't think, that their prime export is apples, that thing which tempted Adam and Eve and resulted in them being cast out from the Garden of Eden. It's probably no coincidence either that Steve Jobs named his technology company Apple, or that the logo has a bite taken out of it. Eventually, Sergeant Howie comes to the conclusion that the missing girl must still be on the island, that she's intended as a sacrifice for the villagers' May Day celebration, to try and appease the gods and make their crops grow again. Howie disguises himself as the fool. Miss, I hope you don't think that I can be made a fool of indefinitely. He infiltrates the ceremony, where eventually his suspicions seem to be confirmed as the missing girl is finally revealed, readied for sacrifice. Now, finally, is Sergeant Howie's time to shine, to act out the highest, most noble calling of his faith, his duty to the law, and to gallantly rescue the terrified girl. She leads him through a cave, away from the other villagers, and out through a hole in the ground, symbols of femininity and rebirth whose importance is soon made clear. 
It's at this point that so much of the film finally comes into focus that the audience, along with Sergeant Howie, are finally given the complete picture. The villagers' quaint politeness is crystallized into a deer-in-the-headlights religious ecstasy. Willow's efforts to tempt Sergeant Howie are revealed more than just a simple contest of beliefs, but as a kind of test of his purity, his virginity. The whole entire ruse is in fact a sort of tempering, ensuring the perfect sacrifice, a sacrifice as calculated and as conditioned as when Lord Summer Isle's grandfather first remade the island. The villagers use Sergeant Howie's beliefs and his deep sense of right and wrong against him. They make a trap of their persecution, perhaps informed by the persecution of pagans in centuries past. There's a moment where Sergeant Howie says to Summer Isle, Fruit is not meant to be grown on these islands. It, it's against nature. Well, don't you see that killing me is not going to bring back your apples? Summer Isle, you know it won't. Well, go on, man. Tell them. Tell them it won't. I know it will. If your crops fail this year, next year you're going to have to have another blood sacrifice. Next year your people will kill you. On May Day. It's a bit of dialogue that's especially relevant today, where every over-eager participant in the latest cultural sacrifice is one bad tweet away from being put up on the same altar. As the villagers prepare Sergeant Howie for sacrifice, he defiantly reaffirms to them his beliefs as a Christian. I believe in the life eternal, as promised to us by our Lord Jesus Christ! To which Lord Summer Isle says, That is good. For believing what you do, we confer upon you a rare gift these days, a martyr's death. It's hard to say just how sincere Lord Summer Isle is being in offering this sort of compromise to Sergeant Howie, in allowing for subjectivity between the pagan and the Christian beliefs. Even as Sergeant Howie is burned alive, there is no real victory of one faith over the other, at least not in the sense that one is validated as any more true. There's no telling whether the villager's sacrifice will pan out and make their crops grow again. There's no scene at the pearly gates answering whether Sergeant Howie has ascended to heaven or not. The only measure of spiritual or ideological victory here on Earth, the only one that we can see, is power. Underneath all our self-righteousness, underneath all our appeals to truth, beauty, charity, happiness, it's only the beliefs that are able to cultivate and maintain the most power that ultimately win the day. It's at once chilling and blackly comic, the people of Summer Isle joining hands, smiling and happily singing while they set fire to the wicker man with Sergeant Howie inside. Sergeant Howie tries rivaling the villagers singing with his own, with a reciting of Psalm 23, but is drowned out by the flames and the more numerous pagans. He retreats to prayer in the burning heart of the wicker man. His final words are an agonized scream, calling out to his lord and savior. Wicker Man has existed in a few different versions over the years, which, like the different schisms in a religion, has sparked debate over which one is best. I've yet to see the full director's cut, but comparing the theatrical version to the final cut, I think I prefer the theatrical. I'm not sure what any additional scenes on the mainland might add to Howie's character that can't be gleaned while he's on the island. I like the immediacy of the final cut and how it's completely constrained to the island. There's some behind-the-scenes odds and ends that didn't really make it into the main body of the video. The fact that uh, Christopher Lee didn't take any pay for his role and helped to put up some of the money to secure the rights to the book. The fact that Britt Eklund's lines were all dubbed. The Wicker Man has some interesting behind-the-scenes stuff for anyone that's curious. In any case, thank you for watching. Let me know what you think. Like and subscribe, because it helps with the, the motivation. I write books. If you like books, books, there's a link down below. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.